Good afternoon, colleagues, and very welcome to this for, webinar for industry users. My name is Irene Zanetti, and I am a change manager at EMA's Veterinary Medicines Division. Since the new regulatory framework for veterinary medicines requires several changes to Eudral GMDP, the most notable uh, of which is the integration of the database with EMS Organization Management Service, OMS, we have organized today's webinar to cover the implications for industry users resulting from this integration. We will provide you with insights on the OMS services and activities, the change request process, customer service, and data quality management. Um, the slot on the OMS uh, will be articulated over four modules. Uh, and uh, after each of the modules, we will have a question and answers time. Participants who have joined the event via WebEx will be able to type their questions into the chat. And uh, participants who are following the live broadcast can uh, send emails to uh, vetchange.program at ema.europa.eu. So the email account that was also mentioned on the event web page. There will be also a dedicated question and answer slot at the end of the webinar. And we will do our best to reply to all your questions today. Should that not be possible due to time constraints, we will still reply to all those, all your questions sent through the chat and our functional mailbox um, and publish them on the event web page after the event. This session is being recorded and it will be published on the event page on EMA's website. Uh, by continuing to be in the session, you consent to the recording and to the process of your personal data by EMA. Should you have any additional questions after the webinar, you can also email them to our functional mailbox and we will include the answers in the documentation that we will publish. Um, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our colleague Maria Filancia of EMA's inspection office. Maria, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irene. Good afternoon, everyone. I will open this uh, webinar with um, um, a presentation on um, uh, what the integration of IMS into UDRA GNDP means in terms of changing to UDRA. Um, and in particular, we'll try to focus on um, implication for industry users. Um, if you don't know me, I work in the inspection office and um, I use UDRA GNDP mostly as everyone else in the public domain does. So I usually do, I used to uh, download GCP certificate, GMP certificate, and uh, um, all the documentation available in UDRA. So um, this insight is the same that you will have, essentially, uh, in respect to NCAs. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the, um, the points that I will cover, so I will just briefly give you an overview of the new um, veterinary regulation, just to set the scene. I'm not, I do not intend to go uh, into the details of the regulation, but I will focus on the impact uh, for, um, for UDRA GMDP. The second point is indeed a couple of slides on uh, UDRA GMDP and uh, what the changes uh, implies. And then I will conclude with some uh, take home messages for you. So, Regulation 2019 6, uh, you know, is the new veterinary uh, regulation that is going to replace Directive 2001 82 as of 28th of January of next year. So, this uh, new regulation aims at achieving a better uh, regulation within the EU, providing a modern and innovative and fit for purpose uh, legal framework. Uh, tries to incentivize and to stimulate innovation, uh, increasing um, also product availability for what concerns veterinary medicines, and also strengthens the EU action uh, to fight antimicrobial resistance. Um, on this slide, you can see uh, the timeline of uh, the regulation. It was approved in December 2018, and since uh, then it was published in 2019. And since that, uh, the 27th of January of that year, uh, we have been given three years uh, of implementation period. So um, to implement all the uh, legal basis uh, for this regulation. Um, and therefore now we are in October 2021, uh, where the time is sticking and we are trying to finalize all the, the work um, that needs to, to be done in order to be ready for uh, next uh, January. So 
um, the only focus that I want to give for the, uh, for the regulation, it's about the IT systems that are being established uh, with the articles of this new regulation. So in, on this slide, you can see um, a picture with the, the, main, uh, I mean, the main IT systems. First of all, the union product database, which is the database where all uh, medicine authorized for veterinary use will be published. And therefore will be consultable. This is linked to the Union Pharmacovigilance Database. It's also linked with antimicrobial sales and news data. And also it's linked with the manufacturing and also distribution database, which is the focus of today's um, presentation. But before moving into this, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the upper part of this slide. Uh, you can see we are trying to implement the SPOR um, dictionary into this database simply because uh, we are trying to uh, achieve uh, a standardization of data that can be easily uh, retrieved and shared um, in order for all of us to speak the same language also for across the, the databases. So focusing more on the manufacturing and wholesale distribution database, what is this database? I want to say since the start, it's, not, it's nothing new. This database uh, will contain uh, manufacturing uh, authorization, so uh, manufacturing and import authorization, wholesale distribution licenses, GMP uh, certificates. So, Really, this database also exists, and you are aware that we already have one in place, which is UDRA GNDP. So what we have done so far is not to create a new database, but to adapt UDRA GNDP to the provision of the veterinary regulation. So it's important to, be, to understand that this is not going to be an additional database. It will be UDRA GNDP implementing the provision of the regulation. So let's uh, go a little bit more to, into the details of the veterinary regulation and the UDRA GNDP modules. So on the bottom part of this presentation, uh, you can see the main articles of the regulation, Article 91, 91 establishing the, the database, a related article uh, with the manufacturing authorization requirements, the GMP certificate, and so on. All of these are then already available in UDRA GNDP. And in fact, in the upper part of this slide, you can see the modules already present in, uh, in our database. So we have the MIA model, which is already currently being used for human and veterinary companies. The GMP, uh, compiling information on GMP certificate, as well as statement of non-compliance and uh, inspection planning. And again, also this model is currently being used for human and veterinary medicine. Um, and then the other three modules, the WDA, so the Wholesale and Distribution Authorization, the GDP, Good Distribution um, Practices, and the IPI uh, registration, these are currently used for uh, human medicines but as part of the veterinary regulation are being extended to, uh, to also the use of, for veterinary companies. Um, so um, the legal basis for the veterinary regulation is to have established the WDA and the API registration. And this is the work that is being done right now and is trying to be, obviously, the aim is to have it uh, completed by the 28th of January. There is no clear legal reference to the GDP part, but uh, we, um, it makes only sense to also extend the GDP module to veterinary. So I want to confirm that this is going to be done, but after uh, the deadline of January, simply because right now we are focusing on what is needed for uh, to meet the deadline. So, but uh, from uh, February onwards, also the GDP module will be extended to veterinary. So with the next uh, set of slides, I want to give you more details on, um, on the changes and the impact that the implementation of the veterinary regulation has on UDRA GNDP. So first of all, as, you, as I said already, extend, extending the WDA, API reg and GDP module, it's one of them uh, for sure. But there is a, a layer of complexity um, because uh, the veterinary regulation requires also the established of a referential link between the union product database and uh, the UDRA GMDP. So, uh, 
the union product database it's already consuming data from OMS, which is uh, the dictionary for uh, the organization. OMS stands for Organization Management and Services, and more details, of course, will be given in the next part of this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, but because so we needed to establish a link means that we needed to integrate OMS into UDRA GMDP. Um, and this not only for the veterinary side, but also for the human side. So this means that all the modules are being integrated with OMS, um, irrespective of whether the company is human or vet. And so this change uh, interests all um, the database. Uh, and there are implications to this that will be shown in my next slide. Um, an additional change that you will see, of course, in the static text of UDRA GMDP portal, you will see the reference to the new legal basis and other information such as uh, whether that certificate applies to, to veterinary or not. So what are the main changes for, uh, for you as industry uh, when it comes to integrating OMS into UDRA GMDP? Um, OMS is a dictionary, meaning that um, the name and, ad and address of a company is going to be recorded in a standard way following certain uh, criteria uh, that my colleague will show you later. Uh, this means that uh, if a uh, name and address of a company, a manufacturer, is not present in OMS, uh, because of the integration, is not going to pre be present in UDRA GNDP, and authorities, while now they can add it directly in UDRA GNDP, they will not uh, be able to do that anymore. Again, because we need to ensure standardization, and therefore standardization is ensured by having that link with OMS. This means for you that as of next January, if before applying for a new uh, manufacturing authorization or before applying for an update authorization for all the modules, of course, at least except GDP, uh, you will have to first make sure that that company that you are interested in it's uh, in OMS. And to do this, you need to raise a change request to OMS. Uh, you will obtain more information about this, this process, but what I want you to be aware is that the change request takes five to 10 days to be processed. And basically between these five to 10 days, if your request is accepted, uh, you will get the name and address added in OMS, which does not mean that it's added in UDRA, because to do this, uh, there is um, a one more working day to synchronize um, OMS to UDRA GNDP. So be aware of this time and try to think in advance before applying uh, for uh, anything. So when you know that you're going to need something from UDRA GNDP and you know that that company is not present there, try to uh, play with time and try to um, raise a change request on time. Um, you will hear more, as I said, about raising a change request, uh, but I invite you to, to, to talk also with national competent authorities and trying to, again, um, be on time for this. Um, OMS, and uh, this is the, la the last point on this slide, is that because OMS is a, use, is try to standardize the, the addresses, you will see that maybe the address it provided will be slightly different from what will be shown in OMS, and I'm not referring definitely to the different names of the street, but uh, for example, the presence of absence of commas um, and so on could, could be noted. Uh, this is just because um, there are certain rules, rules of standardization that will be followed. Additional um, um, points important for you. Um, so when a company is uh, recorded in OMS, it will be um, identified with um, an organization ID and a location ID. Um, these um, two identification numbers uh, will then be also available in UDRA GNDP, meaning that you can also search, uh, if you know the, the identification number, you can do a search um, only with that. So. Um, just to confirm that these two information of OMS will also be shown in UDRA. Um, another important point, um, as I said, OMS is a dictionary, 
and use standard terms or standard way of recording a company. Um, this means that um, if, if now uh, maybe for one company uh, and one address, uh, additional details were added by the inspectors to that address. For example, um, the, un the unit that was inspected or uh, the actual door number, if the, the site has a bigger door, is big and has more than one door number, this is not going to be uh, shown anymore as of January. Um, this is because OMS will, will not will try to, to have just one detail uh, linked to one company. However, um, a, comp a competent authority will still be able to add any specific details related to, to the company that was inspected, for example, um, in the actual certificate, because as you know, the um, there is a field which is called restriction and it's a free text field. So uh, authorities will still be able to add any specific point which is related to that specific event. Um, so this level of granularity will not be lost, but definitely is not going to be represented in OMS. Um, in UDRA, as I said, you will see also the new legal basis and the veterinary field. And therefore authorities will be able to select if um, a license or a certificate will apply to veterinary or human. Um, so what is the message that I want to give you to you today? Well, as I said, as of the 28th of January of next year, it's really important to make sure that your organization uh, um, is currently present in OMS. And if this is not the case, you need to change a, um, a cha you need to raise a change request and, and bear in mind the, uh, the timelines. So if your organization is there, then there is nothing to be done. But if it's not there, again, you need to register. And this it's very important in particular in cases you are foreseeing an upcoming inspection or um, you foreseen that in February, for example, there is a certificate to be issued. Um, so in order you know, to set expectation and to uh, have any certificate on time, try to, to think um, in advance uh, and then raise a change request. So my message here is more uh, for you to start to do your own um, uh, search on what is available or not, and also engage with competent authorities uh, so that uh, um, you are ready uh, next year. Um, this is my last slide uh, where you can see the email address where you can uh, send any other question you have today or uh, any other day and also the link to, my, to the main page where we publish updates uh, on this work. Uh, I thank you and I close here and I'm happy to, to reply to any question you have. Thank you very much, Maria. I would, uh, there are some questions and colleagues have already been uh, started replying to those in the chat. Uh, many of those will be actually covered within the presentations of uh, our colleague Deborah on the OMS uh, services and activities. So I would actually suggest that we move on to the first one, which will already uh, reply to many of the doubts and questions of colleagues participating. And then we take uh, uh, the questions not covered after the first module. Um, so if you agree, uh, I would give you the floor, Deborah. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, for joining our our webinar. Um, just like it and uh, already mentioned, and Maria as well, I'm going to briefly uh, guide you through all the OMS uh, activities and uh, everything we do. So my name is Deborah Braga. I'm the current OMS business lead, and I will try to show you everything we do and try to explain our basic rules so that uh, your initiation or the continuation of your work with OMS happens uh, smoothly. So throughout uh, my presentation, um, I'm going to be showing you one of the four uh, domains that SPORE Master Data have. Um, I'll start with some key principles. I'll show you uh, how give you some uh, quick tips on how to to manage our our website our OMS portal the place where you can actually perform search um i'm going to briefly uh, uh show you how OMS it's what is the role that OMS will have in this uh, other GMDP integration in order just to to do uh, some sort of roadmap 
<laughs> to localize ourselves and how OMS work will indeed impact other GMDP uh, work. And then um, show guide you through all our OMS processes, the so famous change request process. This is going to be the most used functionality in OMS. And uh, last but not least, also important, uh, our customer service, how I manage it, and how we manage our data quality. It is also uh, very important. So I'll start uh, with uh, some brief uh, information and key principles uh, on the OMS. So the OMS service uh, supports the implementation of ISO IDMP standards in European Union. Um, by providing a single source of valid organization and location data. This data can be used afterwards uh, in regulatory uh, activities or even business uh, process. Uh, why they will create uh, this dictionary? So this, the creation of this dictionary uh, came from the need that uh, indeed there was the need to have a better uh, management of organization data. And to initially build our dictionary, uh, we imported, we use data from five internal uh, sources, one of them actually being Eldra GMDP. So we already have some data there. And I will show you afterwards the, the status where we are in making sure that once Eldra GMDP go live, we have all the necessary data for any future uh, submissions. Um, our dictionary, just to uh, to give you uh, an overview. So we handle the data, we build our dictionary not only through a change request, this is where uh, we ask your help to help us improving our dictionary on the day-to-day -day basis. But as I was mentioning, we also do some integration with internal systems and business process. We'll, we'll go through it. Uh, later on on the presentation, but just to to give you this um, this uh, overview that the data can change not only through change requests, but because offline we keep doing some data cleansing and data integration, and there may be some changes that uh, you can see visible even if you do not submit the change request. But the goal is always the same. The idea is always to make sure that OMS has the latest version of the data. Um, so, as I was as I was saying, OMS data is hosted uh, by EMA, hence this uh, presentation. <laughs> this uh, this dictionary is accessible to everyone that has access to uh, to our link. So, OMS, as we've been saying, OMS is supposed to provide the aim of it is supposed to provide a, a central source of organization data. We, from here now on, you'll, we always refer to it as an OMX, uh, OMS uh, dictionary. In this dictionary, uh, it's no more than a list of organization and all uh, associated uh, physical locations um, to be used, of course, in regulatory procedures. Um, how do we categorize an organization? How can we call it an organization? And Maria already um, already mentioned a bit this. So there is indeed in here, I would like to call your attention because there will be some slight difference on the way the organization data is managed in Eldra GMDP and the way OMS manages the organizations. So in OMS, an organization, each, organ each record will be uh, captured as a legal entity in a certain jurisdiction. So we'll have an organization as per uh, the legal basis of that organization in a certain country. To each of those records, uh, it will be assigned an org ID that will be assigned to the organization and to any location that will be underneath those uh, organizations, it, to each of them, it will assign a, a single lock ID. This is a single ID, is not duplicated anywhere in the system. Even if you have, let's imagine, uh, the same physical place, you can have it uh, actually connected to multiple organizations 
uh, to multiple legal entities, I mean to multiple law, to multiple organization IDs. If you have such case, and I will show you a very practical case. I think it's easier if we if we see it later on because I collected one case that will show exactly what I meant with this lock ID being unique and not uh, duplicated in the system. So I'll, we'll keep it, we'll go back to it later on. Uh, as part of our data cleansing to highlight that uh, what we're doing, and this is something that I will be able to show you afterwards as well, is uh, as part of the our data cleansing, and this is why you will see later on appearing directly in other GMDP, well, uh, the org IDs, and the lock IDs, because as part of our data cleansing, we're doing a mapping and we are importing into OMS the other GMDP site reference numbers. These codes will be public and will be published in our uh, portal. And this is how the integration will take place throughout those mappings. Um, exactly, okay. So uh, what, do we, what do we have here? Also very important. This is also um, one of the most frequent questions we have in OMS. I understand that this didn't happen in the past, but with OMS, some there will be some changes implemented. And in OMS, there is no differentiation between an organization that is used in the human context versus an organization that can be used in a veterinary context. The same happens or for roles there are there may be used in a regulatory procedure afterwards, because as you know, an organization can assume a market a marketing authorization holder in one procedure, and on the other hand, if we look into a different procedure, the same legal entity can actually uh, be um, have a role of manufacturer in a totally different. Uh, regulatory procedure and for this reason and picking up a bit the concepts that i've already shown you in the previous slide oms is supposed to provide uh, uh, a dictionary of organization and location details and for the reason we are not going to capture any uh, relation to the any of the regulatory procedure other the roles and the the context to which um, if they are applicable to human or veterinary uh, medicinal uh, products. This, of course, we provide the dictionary and this segregation, this assign, because we understand it's important, this will happen at the consuming system um, level. So in this case, today we're talking about the other GMDP, all this will be assigned indeed uh, at the other GMDP level. We are only providing a dictionary a standard list of organization and location uh, details. Uh, so uh, other important um, principle is that OMS uh, does not capture individuals. So OMS, again, going back to my previous slide, OMS captures org records from the legal perspective. We understand that we can have individuals registered within the trade registry, but those cases for us, they are handled as an organization. And this is what we look when we're trying to validate the data. This is the validation, this is part of the validation process. We can have, indeed, you can tell me, but you can have individuals register. You can, as long as they are registered within the, the, uh, the a certain jurisdiction and within the national uh, business registry. This is these, Those are the only exceptions. Another principle is that the OMS will not uh, capture any department or uh, lines, uh, uh, manufacturing lines, these will not be captured at organization level because again, <laughs> going back to the first, to the previous slide, OMS captures from the legal, uh, uh, from the legal perspective. So we'll kept the record at the higher level. So if we're talking an hospital or a university and the record today in Elder GMDP, the organization name in Elder GMDP actually captures the hospital plus the department information, when we import the data into OMS, this, this department information will be 
lost and you will have the data will be mastered as the main as the main uh, entity the main legal entity this information will cover also, also later on they can be captured at the certificate level in order not to lose any of this uh, detailed information um, in terms of versions oms versions how we manage uh, the versioning of the data it's not the same numerical format that we see uh, ever, uh, in most of the in most of the systems in oms we use a uh, uh, version timestamp so we use this versioning you is something that you often uh, see in our portal you have you see this this format this tells you um if you're using what is the the version that you are you are accessing in the day that you're consulting our uh, dictionary as I mentioned already, always good to reinforce that OMS will always capture the latest information available. So we are not going to create or retrieve any legacy data. The aim of our OMS is always to capture the latest information available. And one of the major principles <laughs> And we have also received a lot of questions on this hand is, after all, who can submit those changes in OMS? So this is very important to understand that anyone can submit any change to any of the organization and location currently published in the OMS dictionary. The only restriction is that we require to have a supporting documentation and this supporting documentation is so that we can indeed validate the data because upon the submission of a change request the data is not public uh, automatically is not published to everyone to see no the record is created provisional and only once our internal e team which we call it uh, EMA data stewards once they handle the change request and at, at the, the, that time that they go through all the validation process, one of the requirements being the supporting documentation, we validate. And if we see that everything is according to the source, supporting documentation is correct, and the source systems also, we are able to validate the data, only then the data is finally published on the OMS portal. So this is a very frequent asked question that we have. Anyone, you can change anything that you, we have in our dictionary as long as you provided the supporting documentation. Um, now, something that uh, Maria already uh, mentioned, which is um, the biggest principle of them all, let's say, uh, is that OMS data uh, intends to provide a standardized list of organizations and locations. And for this reason, you may recognize, you may see that the information, the way we display the data, it may not be an exact copy of your documentation or of the information available in the trade registry. It doesn't mean that the data is wrong. We have our rules published in our dictionary we are constantly updating that um, that uh, our document so that you can always understand that the data that you have in front of you is indeed the same representation is an equivalent information to what uh, you have on a trade registry on your documentation and the com indeed the company that uh, you may work for or you need to register. Important to understand that indeed some slight changes can be accepted as long as we assure that we are referring to the correct organization. So we have the correct organization name and the correct legal entity. We need to make sure that we have the correct relationship between the organization and the location. And we need to make sure <laughs> that we have the correct physical place linked to this organization. These are the main checks we need to, to do. Any 
enrichment that you may see at organiz at the um, uh, location level, any commas that you might be not seeing between the organization name and the legal entity, this this is not it shouldn't be a problem because it's as long as the representation is the same, you'll be assured that the data uh, is the same and there wouldn't be any 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 doubts to the representation of the data. As I was saying, to validate the data, we do not simply accept all the changes that we submit. I can tell you that we currently we have a, an average of thirty percent of our change requests are actually rejected. So you see that we have a proper validation process, and we use um, all sorts of. And it's very important for us to validate and to make sure that everything that we have in OMS, it actually exists, is uh, it's accurate, and it's correct according to the information available uh, in the reference uh, sources. Um, exactly. It is something that we've, we've been mentioning. Uh, this is always the goal of OMS, is to display a standardized list uh, and that it can be used all across uh, the life cycle um, of the of the product. Um, and in reality, how do we apply? So we looking into it because it seems that there indeed is a very uh, complex uh, process but it's not, it's not that complex. So uh, before adding any record to the dictionary, there are two main steps that we need to make sure we do. One of them is the first one, the validation, and the second one is the standardization. So we first make sure that the data that is in the change request is real, that it makes sense, that it's not, it does not have a mismatch information. And the second, last but not least, we need to, once we validate the data, we need to make sure that indeed uh, the information is standardized as per our OMS data quality rules. Um, so looking at organization, how does it happen at organization level? So the just like I mentioned, we receive a change or a creation of a new organization. We do the validation of the document that we've just received on the change request. We do the validation that the data in the change request is actually uh, in accordance with the document submitted. We validate that once this validation is a pass, we validate it against our uh, source uh, systems. We make sure that the data indeed is is real and the document indeed is reflecting the reality. Once this validation uh, takes place, and we, it it's all all of those uh, points uh, are a pass. Then we can create. We have the assumption that we can create the data in our system, and the only thing needed is we need to standardize the data as per our rules. When we look at location data, when we have either we are creating an organization, we always need to validate that the relationship with its location, it actually makes sense. We need, we use again, our reference sources to, to do this validation. But when we look at the creation of a location, the steps are basically the same. We do the validation against first to make sure we have a valid document, Second, we validate against the trade our against our source system, depending on the jurisdiction, of course. And once this validation is a pass, we go into the standardization. This standardization at the location level, we have an extra help, which is our system is populated with information provided by the National Postal Service. And this is a major help for us because they give us some extra reassurance that the location data that we are mastering is actually real and is mailable. It means that the data, this system help us validating the data. It means that the data that we are publishing, indeed, if you try to access that location, you will indeed reach a single point in the map. 
for other cases uh, that for some reason the, that location may not be available in the in the national postal service because imagine that is a PO box address imagine that it's a recent street and for this reason is not in yet been published uh, or made available within the files provided by the national postal service and for this reason we have uh, some standard rules as well for locations and we apply those uh, standard rules um, to master the location now going back a bit to to how these files and how can we assure that this is this is a viable option how can we make sure that this is actually a good source because it's doing a major it's doing a major part of this, the work so uh, in our system um, we have this uh, national uh, we have a, a library uh, of information that is populated by each uh, national postal service um, and we call it the trade name is address doctor this address doctor is um, is a worldwide system populated with reference data that uh, covers uh, more than uh, 240 countries so we have all this information coming from each national postal service and this uh, tool is the only service uh, that combines uh, aside from this information it also combines the uh, the certification from the from all five global postal organizations. So we, we, aside from the complete dictionary, we have the certification from the major five uh, postal uh, services. Uh, the address uh, format, these files, of course, it, it's a major help for us on the format because the standards will be applicable. The ones that we're gonna use is gonna be the ones uh, according to the local uh, standards so the standards used by the local uh, postal service and this way we can assure uh, the correctness of the elements that appear and the the way they appear and that make sure that they appear in the correct fields uh, so these files our our internal files are updated uh, throughout the year more than once a year um, and this service also allows us uh, not only to enrich uh, our addresses um, at the address uh, at the street level, it also enriches uh, our addresses with geocodes, which unfortunately these geocodes will not be made available in other GMDP, but they are currently published in the OMS portal. Aside from these enrichments, uh, we this system also help us uh, validating different uh, character sets, <laughs> and it help us uh, translate some of those special characters. I mean, uh, some of the Greek characters and Japanese characters. What the system does is every time uh, the the an location is recognized by the postal service by the local postal service the system always makes the main address in english this is the language used uh, at european level and in addition if it's recognized a local language a version of the local language and a new version of the address will be created in the local language um, this of course will only happen if indeed the address is recognized we are not adding any of those translations manually because there may be as you can imagine we have here a bunch of special characters that we are not we may not be very familiar with <laughs> going back to our face where can you find us so this is our uh, web page uh, the where you can find uh, the dictionary uh, you have it's a very short link we have as i was saying oms is one of the four domains of spore uh, you can access to our dictionary 
by accessing the, the portal, click on your organizations and you'll be prompt with the query. Of course, you always need to refine your search because by now we already have a very extensive uh, dictionary. Um, this, as I was saying, this dictionary uh, is public. Anyone can access uh, to the information. This is the access uh, that is granted to everyone. So everyone can see everything. It doesn't mean that everyone can change anything without logging in. So they can see the content and that is it. To be able to update the data, you'll need to request a SPORE role and this is handled through EMA uh, account management. Of course, I would like to highlight there will be some rules and we follow these rules. It's very important for us to make sure that the first super user, this is the highest affiliation you can have because it's the one that has more power in managing the users that are affiliated to a single organization. And for this, we have some, some rules. It doesn't mean that the following super users cannot, do, do not need to follow the same rules, but the, we are very strict with the first super user that has, that requests us this. All the, all the rules, they are available in our uh, dictionary. In, in the same portal, you have the organization tab. And you also have the documents uh, section where you have all sorts of guidance. You have a very detailed screenshot uh, manual on how to use the system, how to submit a change request. The Bible that I was talking uh, before, uh, it's also published here, the OMS data quality standards. Here also very important uh, that I already mentioned, uh, a guidance on supporting documentation. This guidance is also very complete, is tailored depending on the type of change request you're submitting, depending on the jurisdiction of the data that you're trying to submit. There are all these factors that can affect to the supporting documentation. What is the best supporting documentation for your change request to be indeed approved? and the data successfully created in our uh, dictionary. We, this presentation will also be uh, made available in our, in, our, in our website so that you can, uh, the recording will also be made available, but that I'll leave it my, uh, to my colleagues <laughs> to the next publication. Uh, we'll be presenting here the content itself. Uh, and I think at uh, the registration that we were talking, uh, we also have uh, a detailed manual on the rules applicable to which of those, uh, which of these uh, roles that you have here. All of them have different characteristics and all of them have different requirements for you to use them. So I would refer to this OMS user registration manual, everything is there. You only need, and we have a very complete, very complete manuals with a lot of pictures. They can be very extensive, but they have a lot of pictures. They are very user-friendly. You just need to go through them and it should be pretty straightforward. Um, last but not least, how do we display the data? How can you make sure you're performing the search correctly? How can you search for your organization, basically. This is going to be <laughs> the key uh, when you access the OMS portal, of course. So OMS is displayed in a concept of one organization per country. The, all the locations will be indeed under the same uh, of organization, depending, and this organization will be duplicated as many times as many locations there are underneath the organization. And as I was saying, uh, the change request submitters, uh, the, once you submit a change request, the data is not published um, automatically. First, it goes through the validation and only then it's published in the dictionary and in the portal. Um, you can, we have uh, the functionality, you can search using all sorts of different fields. And this is how we present the outcome of a search. 
I was saying. For example, we have uh, this case that when you look at the organization level only, it may seem that you have several duplicates, quite a few duplicates here. But when you look at the relationship with the location, you can see that in reality, all of them are actually different locations. So this is what is important, is uh, to make sure that indeed all the necessary data is available in the dictionary, but also to understand that the organization will be visible as many times as many locations that are linked to that same organization. And a practical example of what I was mentioning, one of the first slides, which is, um, what if we have the same physical place that, but is actually being used by all sorts of different legal entities? How can this be tackled? Is it the same lock ID? Is it going to be a different because it's the same physical place? But just to remind you that even if the physical place is the same, do not forget that those IDs, those location IDs, are established according to the relationship with the organization. So we can have multiple duplicates of the same physical address, but because they are linked to a different organization, the relationship is different. And for that reason, the lock ID will be unique and will be generated accordingly. Um, this is the outcome of the query. When you open a record, the view is slightly different, but just to show you a simplified version of this view. So when you open a record, you'll have all sorts of information uh, there. You can have the org ID, you'll have the name, you'll have, in case we'll see later on, you can have also some alternative names displayed here at organization details. At location, also the same basic information. You'll have the log ID, the details, in case it's a non-speaker, uh, non-English, <laughs> non-English speaker country. In this case, we're talking Spain. You'll be, and the, because the address is uh, recognized by the National Postal Service, we, you'll be, by clicking this drop-down list, you'll have access to the same data in the local language. You can see that the data was recognized by the Postal Service because it also has geo coordinates associated to the location. One of the mappings that I was mentioning before is also publicly available in our uh, website, in our portal. Um, to highlight, this is also a very frequent question, which is, is this, but I cannot find this ID in the documents in my certificates to highlight that this, this Eldred GMDP ID is not referring to the document ID, but to the site reference ID. We understand that this ID may be not always visible to all the users, uh, but this ID, it's going to be a plus to make sure once we finish the data cleansing, all the data will be uh, ready to be used in Eldred GMDP, and we're not going to miss uh, anything. Uh, that is today in other GMDP. And last but not least, uh, this is the so-called time, uh, the versioning of the data, just, to, just by uh, curiosity. So, and how does all these rules in a very uh, uh, practical way, how, how can this be applicable to other GMDP? How does it, this integration happen? How is it going to be in the future? So. I'm not going to go into much detail, but there are some practical examples that I would like to uh, to show you and some guidance uh, for the future. So, OMS, I, most probably most of you uh, are not aware of this, but OMS went live uh, in June 2017. So we've been mastered uh, the data for quite some time, and uh, this mastering of the data, this bringing other data on board from other source systems, they happen in accordance 
to the projects that are currently active, that are currently taking place, and with new integrations with OMS. So the goal is to have OMS used in every regulatory process throughout, as I mentioned, right, throughout the life, sec the life cycle of the medicinal uh, product. And how do we do this integration? So this integration, as I said, happens when there is an active project, there is a synergy between our team and the project uh, team. We onboard and consecutively expand our OMS uh, dictionary, and these happen hand in hand with the integration with, let's say, with the physical integration of the process itself. So we integrate this content uh, throughout not only data onboarding, but also data cleansing, because this is part of our, of the rules that I've already mentioned. OMS is not, does not only it's not only to, man to manage the organization, but we also standardize that data. And this is all part of the data onboarding and most important, data cleansing. Um, as of today, we already have quite a few uh, processes already integrated and already consuming OMS data. So we already have a very extensive dictionary, very complete dictionary. Uh, and one of these projects is the one that we are here today discussing, which is Elder GMDP. And as part of this project, uh, we are work hand in hand to trying to bring, to make sure that we have all the necessary data before the go live. And for this reason, I'm just go. I'm just by curiosity. I will be showing you the the stage of our data cleansing. So this project actually started uh, a few months ago. It wasn't that, that long ago. It's this one is quite a small project, <laughs> but it's very. Uh, it has a lot of data for us to master. We we count. We were able to expand our team, and this helped us, of course, mastering the data way faster and making sure that we're following, still following all our rules, our validation process, and standardize the data accordingly. I'm happy to communicate that we are within, even if we, being a challenge project, but we are within uh, the proposed uh, timeline. So we started with a considerable number of data to master. <laughs> At the time, uh, it was quite challenging to try to narrow down this and to try to prioritize the work to make sure that not no project will be negatively affected uh, with this data cleansing. And this is what, what we did. We managed to narrow down a bit with uh, our current knowledge of the data that we have using data profiling, we managed to decrease considerably uh, the number of data that unfortunately we couldn't do it automatically. So there is indeed a chunk of data that we're going through everything manually and we are making sure that we validate the data and we will be creating the data. Of course, if we're not talking about legacy data, the data will be created uh, in OMS and mapped accordingly, so that it once the go live happens, the data will be automatically available and ready to be used by each member state. So we are currently handling uh, holders, market authorization holders, and uh, for the time being, we are happy to communicate that we already uh, conclude the cleansing of the most used manufacturers. So the ones that were actually more mentioned in more certificates. So this was indeed our first priority to make sure that the ones that are more used will be the ones uh, presented in the dictionary and following, of course, by uh, EEA manufacturers. So all these data should be already available there. If you see that there are indeed probably one or two organizations that actually are classified in the GMDP as a manufacturer in EEA country, to those and to those only, you can create a change request today. If you're not sure about the role of those organizations, then this is not applicable because they can be under one 
of these scopes and for these scopes, the change requests are not to be submitted today. And this is why the guidance and the advice that we always give to our users is not to submit a change request until the go live. Otherwise, we'll have duplicated work. We are cleansing the data, and this is why we, we thought it would be important to share with you uh, the stage of our data cleansing so that you understand the reason why we ask you to wait until the go live, because any data that is today in Eldra GMDP, we are today, we are currently mapping it and we'll make sure that it will be made available upon the go live date. Of course, after this, feel free to create any change request in case you see that there is indeed data missing in our dictionary. Of course, not to forget that any legacy data will not be uh, approved. This will only be applicable to active organizations. Um, and how, what will be in practical, this, this was just an ad hoc information, in practical sense, uh, today, the process, uh, the manufacturers actually handle, or the, the applicants actually handle directly uh, with the member states. And those are responsible, member states, the NCAs, are the ones responsible uh, for managing the information, for adding any missing data into the database so that it will be made available into any of the certificates uh, that will be uh, used. This is the today process. Of course, what we want to achieve is to have a centralized source of information into OMS. As I said, today, there is only uh, information flowing this way because we are still working, we are still bringing on board all the other GMDP dictionary. Once we go live, as of uh, next year, the idea is to shift out some of these errors. And the main difference being that organization and location data can no longer be entered manually uh, by the member states. And they will instead, they will need to first be registered into OMS. So applicants, market authorization holders, and manufacturers will be the ones responsible to verify and to make sure that their organization data is available in the OMS dictionary. Otherwise, they will need to submit a change request within OMS. Until this happen, marketing uh, the member states will not be able to issue any certificate because they will no longer be able to populate uh, the certificates manually and to enter the data uh, manually directly in Eldra GMDP. Um, Another question that we are frequently asked, what about those emergency inspections that may happen? So this is why we have here uh, an external, <laughs> an external uh, member. And for those emergency inspections, uh, we expect to have uh, the data available already in the system since applicants and uh, market authorization holders already populated the information uh, needed in OMS to be used in EAF uh, following the mandate use uh, for uh, centralized procedures, the mandate use of OMS in EAF for centralized procedures, another project that happened and is now becoming uh, mandatory. Uh, now, uh, I already mentioned, but some of those examples we've mentioned in one of the initial slides that indeed there are information that is today available in other GMDP and we understand that it may be important for NCAs and for industries to maintain this information. However, following the OMS data standards, not everything else, everything, all the little information can be added directly into OMS and but we understand it's needed. For this reason, we're trying to work as well uh, with the 
with the project team from my other GMDP to make sure that you'll be able to not to lose this information. However, the data will always need to, organization and location data always need to come from OMS. And what I'm looking into some practical examples, what type of information am I talking about? So we've spotted already a few cases and we identified that, for example, we have some translations that they may be needed. We capture them in OMS as alternative in names. However, when you access other GMDP, the only data, the only details you'll be able to access, it's going to be, when we talk organization, it's going to be organization name only. All these alternative names, they will not be able to they will not be made available to use in a certificate directly uh, in other GMDP. Other example is the so-called trading as uh, companies. This is also captured under the same field, as well as uh, some, there are two exceptions for, uh, for Belgium and, and France, uh, where indeed the legal form is now part of the legal name and for that reason because we understand that it may be needed uh, to indeed to do a proper mapping or so that users can indeed make sure that this is the same record for this reason this is also captured as an alternative name but it's not again it's not going to be made available in other gmdp there is the same thing that is happening at organization level is also happening at location level. So any additional information that is today part of the location, integral part of the location, we're talking departments, manufactured lines, so manufactured facilities, units, all this today uh, is part of a separate record in, in other GMDP, but as part of our OMS data quality standards. Once we bring this data on board, everything we need to look at the data from the legal perspective and everything will be transformed into a single record. I'm showing, I'm going to show you a, an ex, a practical example afterwards. I'm, pre, I, I'm sure it's going to be easier to consolidate uh, this theory uh, part. Other example that we also need to be taking, uh, we also need to to be attentive is uh, the multiple door addresses that may not be recognized by the postal service. So we understand that there are uh, uh, manufacturers that indeed have a very lengthy, <laughs> a very big, uh, very big uh, installations. And for this reason, they can have from uh, door number one to door number 25. And of course, uh, then for some of these cases, not all, there are some that are recognized, but all depends on the information that we receive from the National Postal Service. And going back to the concept and to the mastering data that we do in OMS, this is very important here at the stage because we can create as many records as needed to be used in the certificates, but what we cannot do is create a single address that is actually not recognized by each national postal service. And how do we tackle all this? How can you make sure that the data that you had in a previous certificate is actually correct? And it's actually reflected in the future certificate. So in, in the future, after the go live, the, uh, sorry, just a second. <coughs> After the go live, what you'll have uh, to choose to add in the certificate is going to be only the organization name available in OMS and the location details. <coughs> any uh, extra details, any extra information, one of them being including in these tables, they can be captured as a remark under the remark section of the certificate because this being a, a free field, you can type whatever you want. You can add uh, 
any information that may be needed to identify any <clears throat> any of these uh, details. This is what is going to happen once the go live uh, after the go live date. Of course, we identify that we can improve the user experience. And for this reason, there will be uh, the project team from my other GMDP is doing some work here to improve the search uh, process so that when an NCA actually searches for this data, they can use not only organization name and location details, but can, they can also perform a single search um, using information that may be populated as well in the remarks. Now, before we go into our questions, just to clarify exactly what are looking into these location details, because we understand that may be a bit confusing. And by looking here, you may not recognize the actual problem. So I try to bring some examples of how this happened and what is in reality, how is this translated? And just not to touch base on the theory, what is, does this mean in a practical sense? So we actually had the help from the Austria uh, NCA. They share with us this case. They were a bit concerned how to master this data. Um, and what happened is that today in Neodra GMDP, we have that we have uh, 21, actually 21 records created in Neodra GMDP. All of them, when after we master the data in LMS, we identified that they actually are all the same organization. Of course, then we have some a different can have some different information at location level. But when we look at this small sample of the data, we actually see that we have here all of these records actually mapped under the same. So this is what you'll see. This is how this is happening. We have uh, the organization name. We have this extra information that I, I showed you before. All types of extra information can be made available there. Even other organization names can be uh, available there as extra information. However, when you master the record, this information is not relevant. You, we're talking about the legal entity and the legal entity operates in this address and this is what OMS will be publishing. So we're publishing the legal entity as per the trade registry uh, website, as per uh, the, the data from a certain jurisdiction and we're publishing the address in the same way as per the National Postal Service information. Here you can see that indeed it matches. There is indeed a lot of records under, uh, under this mastered record. And what will happen to this information? Will it be lost? And this is where uh, that field, that remarks field, it becomes important so that indeed you can capture any extra information under this uh, remark section because it's indeed a free field. You can type whatever you want. However, not to forget that all this data, they will all be mapped to the same single record. The other location details that we were referring, which are the multiple door numbers. Uh, this can be, as I was saying, we are always depending on the, on the way the National Postal Service uh, standardize the data. And when we have such robust process, we always follow because <laughs> It's it's a very uh, liable uh, system, so we try uh, to follow it. And for these multiple door numbers, what we can assume two positions. We either create only one record. This is what we do by default. However, if the user uh, tells us with a single change request, if the user tell us that they need to have one location ID to each and every door number, this is fine by us. 
we will create as many locations as needed to be used in other GFDP and all the consuming systems. And how is this translate into the new certificate? So today, this is the, the displayed information in uh, the certificate. After the go live, this option, this data will no longer be available. The other GMDP will consume data from OMS, and this is what you'll be consuming. The certificate will be populated with one single address. Of course, in this case, I pointed out to the number 30. It can be any of this. It's up to the user, whatever. What is the number that they, they would like to see in their certificate? Any additional information? depending of course on the type of certificate, because from my understanding, there are certificates that indeed they can accommodate several locations. In those cases, there can be as many locations as needed. In those cases where the certificate can only accommodate one, again, the details will have to be added in the certificates remarks due to the free text field uh, that we have available there. And we're going to do a pause here in order to clarify any questions that may exist to this. It was a very lengthy, but I think this was one of the crucial is to have the rules in front of us before we go into the actual process. You need indeed to have some consolidated uh, ideas on what is behind the process itself. So any questions we can clarify here? Thank you very this much, Deborah. Video. I believe it was an extremely informative uh, session, and uh, this is reflected in the number of questions that we have uh, got and uh, replied to in the chat. To many of those, you know, you were already um, tackling them during your presentation. Uh, I believe that at this point, since many questions uh, insisted on uh, which type of organization need to take any actions and what is the timeline. Maybe could I ask you and uh, uh, Maria to um, repeat that? Which organizations need to do what and when? Probably that would uh, help all participants uh, get a crystal clear understanding of the next steps ahead. Deborah, do you want to start? As I said, <laughs> I, can, I can start very, very shortly. Um, we, do, we do not have any restrictions to whom can submit a exchange request. This was always one of the uh, key message into our OMS users that giving the liberty to anyone to create anything that they uh, that is needed into our dictionary. Uh, however, when we talk into process itself, there may be some uh, indeed, some role that might be rele more relevant and may assume a more uh, critical role in the registration of the data. And when we talk about the GMDP, I'm assuming, and Maria can um, reinforce probably this, uh, applicants, marketer authorizations will be, and manufacturers will be the ones indeed taking the lead on this registration because you'll be the ones uh, these are the indeed the entities that will have the necessary supporting documentation and they will be the ones triggering any process before it actually started. Maria, yes, I don't know if you would indeed. like to... Let's, I will tell you as a, with an example. So you are a marketing authorization holder who is submitting an application for an authorization of uh, medicine. Uh, Obviously, you use uh, several API manufacturers, finished product manufacturers, uh, distributors, and so on. Now, you can decide to be proactive and ask a change request on behalf of these companies, bearing in mind that you will need to provide all the requested documentation, as Deborah explained, uh, or you can ask to your uh, comp the companies that you use to do so. So it's uh, really, there is no legal or mandatory basis for this. Uh, it's up to you, of course. Uh, it will, we will expect that you are having the overview and the interest in having those uh, companies. Let's say that you know that in order to uh, have an, an application approved, uh, you need to, your manufacturer needs to go through GMP inspection. 
it will be obviously in your interest in having the data in OMS so that then uh, the process is smoother. Um, let's say that you instead are just a manufacturer that you know you're following uh, this uh, this presentation and you uh, want to be proactive and be registered you can do so as well another example i am a national competent authority i'm planning to go on inspection for this site you know the Udra GMDP has an inspection planning module which is only visible to, com to competent authorities. Uh, I go on Udra GMDP, I don't find that company. Well, I will then raise a change request uh, to OMS asking to add that company because I need that, uh, I need to be able to select uh, the name and address of that company in Udra GMDP. So really anyone could do, we will expect uh, the main MH to, do, to, to be proactive, but um, that depends on your needs if you're not foreseeing any specific certificate to be issued uh, as a re-inspection uh, up to you really and the timeline so uh, do not raise a change request now simply because um, um, colleagues are still doing data cleansing in order to be able to have uh, to eliminate all the duplicates in Udra GNDP. Uh, therefore the change requests ha have to be submitted after January uh, the 28th of January of next year um, the new uh, companies added or any companies added in OMS will not be automatically appearing on the current issued certificates. So the current certificate will stay as they are, but the OMS list will be used when there is a need to issue a new, cer a new certificate. You, I, some, some of you have asked, okay, but what if then for the same company, uh, the Udra GNDP address is different from what then it's on uh, OMS. I mean, I'm not expecting a big, huge difference in terms of uh, name of the company and, and address, uh, because otherwise it will be a different uh, location, uh, a different company. Um, maybe, yes, indeed, some discrepancy, small discrepancy might be expected, especially because um, due to the fact that right now the name and address are added as a free text, so inspectors can add the name of the units, more details on how, on which part of the facility was inspected. This is not going to be the case anymore in OMS, but generally, let's say, the, the address should match, should be... 99% the same. So um, I think this is important to, 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 to understand that I saw that many of you have, uh, have asked the, the same similar questions. I hope it's clearer now. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, I believe you clarified many of the questions that were asked in the chat. Um, I would like to still ask a few, one verbally. Uh, one concerns uh, uh, variation packages to be submitted uh, towards the end of November 2021. Um, would industry users need to perform any actions with regards to checking OMS then? So, um, and I, as far as I understand, uh, industry were informed about the mandatory use of OMS for the for the EF. I think in August, if I'm not mistaken, this was then extended this deadline. So yes, in this case, but not for uh, user GNDP. In this case, I believe that there is a mandatory requirement to that OMS will start to be used as of November. And therefore, if you need to submit any application form, then yes, you need to be there in OMS for CAPS. This is my understanding indeed. Yes, that's correct. It's, thank you, Maria. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, Deborah, concerns uh, the definition of an organization in case of a pharmaceutical company or of a manufacturer uh, where can users see that? The definition of an organization. Yeah, so, I, think, I think that for some colleagues, um, it's still maybe a bit abstract to think in terms of organizations and locations. So this is one of the questions and others came. So maybe, you know, if you could uh, stress once more what these two concepts uh, concretely mean. 
I, you, you covered it extensively in your presentation, but just, you know, to um, okay. make I thought I was missing something. Okay. To the concept. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So in a nutshell, very simple. Uh, an organization is no more than a legal entity in a certain jurisdiction. It is no more than a company that is established and that exists and is registered in a certain country. The location details is all the organizations, uh, sorry, <laughs> the location details are all the address information where this organization um, actually uh, exists, where it, it, it ex uh, have activities, regardless if it's uh, working as a market authorization holder, regardless if it's actually a location that is a major uh, a major uh, manufacturer facility what is important is to make sure that an organization exists as a legal entity in a certain country and we will register as many locations as needed depending of course the locations that that organization actually exists i hope this helped I think so. Thank you very much. And there was a question also regarding correspondence addresses in terms of locations. Correspondent addresses. Yes, I'm assuming you're talking uh, PO box addresses. Those are indeed addresses that unfortunately are not recognized uh, by the National Postal Service. It doesn't mean that we're not uh, creating them because we understand <laughs> that they are needed in the system and to use for regulatory procedures. And for this reason, uh, we create them in OMS. They will not be generated any uh, uh, geo coordinates, but we, we have standards on how to create those locations and we will create uh, them as per our data quality standards. We, I can even uh, give you two examples of two exceptions that we have today in our data quality standards. One of them for uh, the translation, it may not be the correct translation, <laughs> but the Germans, please, <laughs> apologies for, for the wrong, it may be not a very literate translation, but we call it the large volume receivers addresses. Those are addresses that are actually recognized as a, as a physical place by the German uh, Postal Service. And this being that to validate this type of data, we go into the German Postal Service. We search using the organization name and indeed in that a specific domain which is the large volume receivers and the system if indeed that location is registered for that organization we will create and why is this an exception because those large volume receivers do not have a street level information in the same way as most typical addresses have no the only thing they have is uh, postal code information city and uh, country. They do not have more information. This is one of the exceptions. The second exception that we actually created uh, recently is uh, with Swedish addresses. Uh, for uh, for we've recently it recently came to our attention that indeed those there for this country there was indeed a need to create a separate rule and to accept those exceptions because indeed in the same way that for the german uh, postal service in the swedish national postal service we have the same thing we have indeed a domain where we can find we can search we can query uh, their local database for those uh, specific addresses and again the, the the rules are similar. We use the organization name to query the National Postal Service and the National if they exist, if they are registered, we will again create a record in OMS that will not have street level information, will have only postal code, city and country information. Those are the only two exceptions. All the other postal code addresses they will be added in OMS, of course, as well, with 
with uh, the, but those are indeed a general rule. But to those, we have indeed a PO box. We have a number of a postal of a postal box. We have the the postal code information. We have the city and we have the country. So I think this is an uh, information that you you were trying to get on this postal code addresses that and how we manage them in OMS. Thank you very much, Deborah. And uh, one of the participants uh, also made uh, um, a question regarding uh, addresses that could be legal representatives of a marketing authorization holder. Uh, can those also be captured um, in OMS? Yes, as long as we have a supporting documentation that help us validating such information, we can have as many locations as needed. Perfect. Thank you. Questions keep coming in and we are also keep uh, answering via the chat. So in the interest of time, I would suggest mo moving to the next uh, module of your presentation um, so that we, we cover all of them. And meanwhile, colleagues, you can keep uh, typing questions. Uh, as mentioned, should we not be able to answer to all of them today, we will uh, publish them following the event. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Irene. So now the so popular uh, topic and one of the most important because this is going to be the one that you're going to use on the day-to-day -day basis, which is how can you change the OMS uh, data and how do you do this? So this this happens through the submission of a change request in our OMS portal. So in a nutshell, and I'm going to go through more uh, detailed information afterwards. In a nutshell, the requester uh, can submit a change request to create or update any of the data in the system. As I said, anyone can submit any change to the system. Important, of course, not to forget <laughs> the so famous supporting documentation. And this is something that we keep repeating. It's because uh, thirty percent of our reject change requests rejected today are due to this to the lack of the supporting documentation, and it's very important because it's a validation process, and the process stops from the beginning. If we need the supporting documentation, and there is no documentation there, we cannot proceed with the validation uh, process. Uh, once the requester submits this change in the system. It goes to our internal team, our EMA data stewards, uh, and they will analyze uh, the request. At this stage, important to know uh, that the organization name and the location data are both available in the document. <laughs> we validate the data. We validate that the information in the document is available in the source systems, the same, all the same process that we already mentioned. When, valida while in validating, um, when we validate once this validation process uh, is concluded, again, not to forget the validation is done, we need to now standardize the data following our data quality uh, rules for, of course, our organization. And we will use the National Postal service information to help us validating the location not validating standardizing the location um, the location details after this assessment is uh, is concluded the change request can either be approved or reject um, and the user of course will always receive an email acknowledgement so the user throughout this process the user actually receives two email acknowledgement, once with the submission, not to forget that with the submission, again, the record is not created, you'll receive an identifier, but this is the change request identifier. We receive this question very frequently as well, which is users tend to, uh, because the change request ID is ORQ, is very similar with 
O-R-G, and users tend to try to move forward and to use this change request ID as an OMS ID. The first email you receive is an acknowledgement message that we receive your change request, and the SLA starts there. It starts counting uh, from then on. We assess the outcome can be approved or rejected, while once we have the outcome, you'll receive a second acknowledgement email communicating indeed this outcome. Was it approved? Was it either rejected? If it's rejected, you'll receive you'll be, uh, the email will be accompanied, will have some comments populated to help you succeed in the future change request. If it's approved, the data will be published uh, with a delay of 10 seconds, will be immediately published in the OMS uh, dictionary. Um, very important. Uh, we have our established a service level uh, agreement. Uh, so how long it takes us to to work through a change request. Um, of course, this is something that is automatically generated by the system, depending on the type of changes the user is submitting. If we're talking, if the user submits a change request to create a new organization or a new location, this is new data, the system will automatically assign a five working days SLA. If it's to deactivate an organization or location, it's something that is not priority. The priority is indeed to add any missing data or to update any data that may be wrong. And for this reason, the SLA assigned will be 10 working days, a little bit, uh, a little bit longer. Of course, we handle uh, the change requests not by the created date. These SLAs are very important for us because they help us work on the change request through first expire, first out. So we always prioritize the ones that have a shortened uh, due date. And the ones that have a longer, they will be handled uh, in second. So. When, while you're submitting a uh, change request, this is the way uh, the form, uh, this is the format of the form you'll see in the OMS portal. There will be some basic information you'll need to populate, some information that is mandatory to highlight that any details that you add from organization details and location details, there will be, once we approve, they will be automatically published and will be public to everyone. This is part of the validation step for the submission of the change request, which is you need to acknowledgement that these two fields, this organization details and location details will be indeed publicly available. Of course, the change request information, this is confidential information and only our internal team will have access to these details. These details will never be shared with anyone. As I said, confidential information. So this is the way the format form uh, looks like. This will be the published information. Here, it seems to be a bit hidden, but very important. This is where you add your uh, document, your attachments, the documents that help us validating the data. Always, never, never forget this. Very important in order not to delay your regulatory procedures because indeed we have our established SLA. The update uh, form is very similar. The only, the main difference being that indeed, because the organization is already available in the portal, there will be some fields, and especially for organization and location ID, because this can never change. <laughs> you can never do any change to these IDs. So they will be grayed out. You're not gonna be able to update this. All the re others information, you'll be able to update. Again, any change that you do here at the bottom, of these two fields, once you submit, once we approve, it will be made uh, public. Never forget again, attachment. Um, what type of changes you can submit? As I said already, you can change anything. You can create one change request to, the, to change only the organization name. You can create a change request to 
actually change both organization and location details. You can amend anything that may be not correctly populated. Of course, always following and never forgetting our OMS data quality standards. Because, for example, all those, the Excel that we were previously discussing and uh, going through with all those manufacturer lines and departments that may exist, this needs to be considered because if you submit a change request to add that information to OMS, of course, this goes against our OMS data quality standards and your change request will be rejected and we don't want that to happen. So very be always very attentive to our never forgetting our OMS data quality standards before actually submitting. If the, If there is data missing, of course, you can create a change request that's why we have such functionality so that you can help us making sure we have the most up-to-date information uh, published okay so uh, i mentioned i mentioned this this part so when you create the change request i've been mentioning it's not automatically populated you'll receive an acknowledgement email and once we approve it you'll receive a second acknowledgement email where you'll um, if it's approved you'll receive the organization id if it's to create a new organization of course it will be populated there if it's to reject you'll be prompt with uh, a few comments we'll go go over that afterwards not to forget as well that uh imagine that uh, if you have um if you realize after submitting the change request that you forget something then you'll need to wait for us to conclude approve either approve or reject the change request so that you can resubmit the the change to a certain record this to say that you can only submit one change request per location at a time so imagine that uh, there are actually two industries working with one manufacturer and by by chance you both actually identify let's say the postal code is wrong the postal code of that location is wrong and one of you tries to update so it creates a change request to update that location and at the same time the second industry is actually trying to go to the system and submit the second change request to perform the same change the system you'll be prompt with a, a red um, written uh, error message saying that only one change request can be submitted at a time this just to tell you up front this is what is happening if the system does not let you if it's telling you that you can only submit one change request at a time it's because someone else already submitted the change and as i mentioned before any related information with change requests who submits what is the status of the change request of another user this is private information and you cannot access uh, to this data so this is one way you can identify that indeed someone else is already trying to update the data that you probably identify an issue so what can now that we're talking i was giving an example of a postal code that probably can be wrong what other updates can you do at a location level so there are a few updates that i would like to share with you because if you try to submit a change request to create uh, to do such changes i can tell you up front they're going to be rejected there's no need that becomes very frustrating for you because if they go against our OMS, this is always a question. Are they going against our OMS data quality standards? If the answer is yes, then we will reject the change request. If the answer is no, and indeed there is something wrong, then of course uh, we will need to review our data and to update accordingly. So one of those changes that we can accept is indeed add a location. Uh, add a, a f or edit a floor to a certain location. This is going back to one of the initial principles, which is the location ID never changes the meaning. So one location ID represents one physical place. So we can never, one location ID will never in the future refer to a totally different location. So for this reason, the only actually thing you can change on a location is no more than adding 
or editing uh, the floor because we're not changing a point in the map. We are going in another, <laughs> in a more vertical, <laughs> in a more vertical way. So we're not actually changing any geo coordinates to the location. And because our locations are generated in two dimensions only, this is why you can update this. Any change that goes against uh, the standards that are published by the National Postal Service, they will be rejected. As well, uh, the way the data is displayed, if we're talking sub-localities that the National Postal Service, and this is very, very frequent with German addresses, because the national, I know that users are not used to see this detailed information in their documentation, but the National Postal Service enrich their locations with such details. And submitting a change request to delete this information, it will lead to a rejection. Any abbreviations, I will show you some examples. They will also lead a non-title case, any adding a comma between the street level and the number. If the comma is not there, it's because the National Postal Service does not recognize, and we cannot ignore the standards provided by the local authorities so that we can uh, replicate the information available in the supporting documentation. When, we when, uh, when an organization moves to a different physical location, what to do? Always create a new location. Never update, because otherwise we're going against our principles. Going back to the beginning, one of our key principles, one physical location is the representation, is captured under one location ID. And that is it. It's never changing. If the, we understand, of course, we understand that a company can move offices. And for that reason, a new location ID will be generated. A new record will be created in OMS. So just to show you some of those examples that they can maybe tricky, uh, but always to remember before submitting any change to the location details, is it actually representing the same physical place? Are we adding any value? If this is not the case, for example, if the change request is to uh, write uh, to overwrite the date into an abbreviation, this will be rejected. We, we're not, uh, we can clearly see that this all belong to the same data. We're not changing the representation of the data. The same thing happened uh, to highlight the same thing can happen to the position uh, where the door number may be allocated. If in the documents is after the street, uh, the street name and in our database is before it's a matter of the data the way the national postal service standardized we're not changing the meaning of the data is the same street information and it's exactly the same door now at the back end you submitted, you saw the form. There is indeed some mandatory information that you need to submit so that we can validate the data throughout the process that I've mentioned already quite some times. So we validate and we standardize the data using supporting documentation, validating against the source system, and last but not least, standardizing against our rules. Apart from this first and major check that we need to do. Uh, EMAs data stewards also need to populate some other fields, uh, which is organization, the organization category. Not to do any confusion here at the level of roles and uh, category that they may assume in a regulatory procedure, human or vet. No, this is not the same categorization. This is a categorization that help us identify and later on, they help us monitoring any industry and assign a different uh, level of between industries and NCAs. This is basically um, the main use of this of this value. So this value does not have any representation, does not make any difference to any of the regulatory procedures. It's simply to help us uh, having a, a, a clear. Uh, dictionary. 
another validation that we do and standardization is the location data, of course. And as I mentioned uh, previously um, already, this address localized, which is an add-in that we have to our uh, National Postal Service that will be added uh, if the address is recognized to any of uh, non-English speaker uh, countries. Now, we've been talking, this is all very pretty, and we've been talking about uh, rules, endless rules. There are so many rules. How can this actually, how do we actually do this in on the day-to-day -day basis? So, and I brought here, uh, this is just uh, extra information. This is a view that you'll never see. This is a view of the system at the back end, the system that we use to master the data. So when you submit the change request using that form that we've already uh, we've already discussed, this is a task that is created in our end, and the user submitted the data. All good. We validate the data against the document submitted by the user. First check is to make sure that indeed the organization uh, is the same and is indeed the data that the user is requesting. Now that we validate the data in the document, we need to go into the in the source system. So in this case, the business, the the UK uh, business registry, we need to make sure that this document indeed came from there and that the data is indeed available uh, in the in the website. Once this is done, we're only missing, we're done with the validation step, we go into the standardization uh, of the data. So these rules are all available in our OMS data quality standards, which is published in Sport Portal, as I mentioned before. And because we're talking of a British uh, organization, we go into the country UK and we see because to all of the countries, we have different. We can have different uh, rules on how to write as a legal entity. This was a, a very extensive search we did at the beginning, and we have been on the day-to-day -day basis. This is a, a continuous process improvement, and we try to update our documentation according to the latest information we have available. And for LTD companies, we do not capture as LTD, we capture them as limited. And while approving the change request, this is a slight change we're going to do on the name. We're not changing the meaning because the name of the organization is the same. We're just standardizing the name, nothing else. This is always what you need to, to have in mind while trying to submit and search in OMS. Is the, is the meaning the same? Is it the same representation of the data, just some standardized rules applicable? If yes, then you, your data is available in the system. How does this process happen at location level? And how does the National Postal Service information come to us? So uh, when we look at, uh, uh, for example, a case as such, where we have what we already discussed, where we have indeed a location that has, as part of the address, another organization name. Okay, we understand that this was information that probably came from a source system. Oh, good. However, first, first things first, we need to validate the data. So first we go, uh, we make sure that we have a valid document, we validate the address is the same uh, the same address, all good. We go into the business registry. We make sure that the document is a valid document. It's not a legacy data. So this is why we need to go to the source system. We go there. We have the validation uh, as a pass. We we have everything good. So we're just missing standardization. And with a single click, we with the help of our National Postal Service information, we we are able if everything is populated in the correct field, we are able to recognize uh, the address with one single click. Uh, of course, uh, if you see the geo coordinates were not available before, but because the National Postal Service recognizes address, now it's adding this information into our system. So in a nutshell, 
this is uh, what happened. And what, what happened in a case uh, the user would like the user, and this is the process I'm sharing with you, the same process that we made at the source follow. Uh, how do you verify that the data in OMS is indeed in alignment with the information uh, posted by the National Postal Service? So if you go through our OMS data quality standards, uh, we have a table there that at the, at the bottom of, uh, towards the end of the document, we have a table that has some guidance from the UPU uh, database. Here you have some general guidance. Our OMS data quality standards, the rules on how to master it and how to display a location, they are actually uh, some of them based on these documents. We actually had uh, this help. But uh, to say that um, at the bottom of each of these documents, uh, we ha we can find uh, the link that will lead us to what is the to the National Postal Service. And it's here uh, where every time we suspect that we have data that is not correctly populated, we go there and we investigate, for example, if we have a change request and the user is claiming that our post, the postal code that is associated to that street is not correct, we go in, this is the process that we follow. We go directly into the National Postal Service and we validate in case, and we try to understand if the postal code that we have is correct or not. In a case, because we have, uh, we do this, process because we've identified a, some residual number, but we've identified a few cases where indeed the postal code was not in alignment with uh, the information provided by the National Postal Service. And now you ask, but how is it possible to have, if you are using the information from the National Postal Service, how is it possible not to be in alignment? Well, it's possible because if you remember from one of the previous slides, our files are updated throughout the year. And it may happen <laughs> that when the location was mastered, we didn't have the latest information, the latest file from the National Postal Service. And we spotted a couple of cases where this happened. And it did, by the, when we mastered the location, we didn't have the latest version or the correct version of the postal code uh, that was actually published by the National Postal Service. And for that, I'm not going to be very extensive here. It's just so that you have this note. We have a process in place every time we identify such cases. We try to get in touch directly with the National Postal Service. We identify that there is an issue in their files in case we haven't received the latest files. We communicate, we tell them, listen, the files that you send us, they are not correct. So you need to update them. <laughs> they update them, they send it back to us, and we have now the data corrected. This can take some time, but for that reason, we have a workaround where every time we identify that there is an, an error there, we overwrite the information provided every time we we see that something is not correct then we are sure that we can ignore the information that we have in our files because later on we've already and uh, did the investigation and we understand that we will later on receive the latest information available so i'll leave you here the information i don't think there's a need to go into much detail here so as i was saying before uh, rejections. Every time there is a change request rejected, you receive an email acknowledgement with the outcome of the change request. And in that same email, you'll have a rejection reason code. This is a very short list. But the one that I'd like to highlight to draw your attention is to this one, the comment providing uh, further clarification and further guidance, further justification to the user how, what happened, uh, is it the, ch the change that the user submitted, is it going against our rules, uh, is it the 
the document not a good document because we were not able to validate the data. All this because this is this is a drop down list and this one is a a free text field. We are able to provide any type of guidance depending on the change request that was submitted and try to guide the user in the best possible way. This to forget it, unfortunately. This is something that we are working on it, which is uh, to have a return change request option. So again, going back to the supporting documentation, if by any chance you forget to submit that supporting documentation, you cannot amend the change request once it's submitted. You'll have to wait for us to handle the change request, and only then you'll be able to submit a change to that same data. As we mentioned already, you can only submit one change request per location at a time. Um, yeah, okay. And this is how we handle uh, rejections. Once now on the more bright side, once the change request is approved, the data is automatically published on the website. This is one of the examples that I was uh, I was referring to the address localized uh, information. So uh, another example of alternative names because for France, this is France, no Belgium, for Bel French and Belgium organizations. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, uh, for French and Belgium organizations, the legal entity type is not integral part of the organization name, and we follow to these two countries only. We follow their same rule. So, we as part of the organization name, we do not add the legal entity. We can add them as an alternative name, but we will add the organization name exactly as it is in a trade registry. There will be some exceptions. We found them already for France and uh, Belgium organizations. There are a couple, a handful, not many, of organizations that you'll be, but you'll see that they're published on the portal with the legal entity type as part of the name. But if you go into the trade registry, you'll see that it's because is the way the record was approved with the local authorities, and this is what we reflect. We always reflect the data as it is and as it's approved by the local uh, authorities. Um, and with this one, we conclude this change request. Again, a lot of information. So any questions here I would like to discuss? Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Uh, I would like to bring up a few topics uh, and ask you, you know, to uh, further spend a few minutes on those that uh, came up from several users. Uh, one concerns the super user role. Um, could you maybe, you know, say a few words about that and just explain whether organizations can outsource this role and if yes, how? Yes, that's a very good question. And I forgot to mention, but it is indeed one of the other very frequent questions. So where do we have them? It's actually part of the other module. It doesn't matter. Uh, the answer, the first answer is no. So for the first super user role, it always needs, if I go back to it, we can see it. So the first super user, uh, when you're requesting this in EMA account management, he needs we need to be able to validate that he has uh, a valid email address that we can link it automatically to the organization name. And we had a few cases where we indeed we had to. Uh, it took us some time to explain this to to the user, but. The first, you can, afterward, you can assign as many super user roles as you would like. It's up to you, but the first super, because the, the consecutive, uh, uh, consecutive roles, they will all be managed by the first super user industry. And this is the reason why we are so annoying, because I know we can be a bit annoying with this role, but it has to be, because 
we've already had a few cases that we had unfortunately uh, we we were prompt with cases where we have organizations contracted organizations that uh, with the old process we approved this request by the time we didn't have this rule we approved the first super user to a contracted organization and then we had the we could see that the user was from had a work email address from that same organization but because there was already an industry user there we could not provide we saw we saw ourselves in there in the situation that we could not provide confidential information it got a bit tangled up and for that reason we now have this rule and we need to keep following and to ensure this every day which is the first super user uh, the first poor industry super user for us to be able to approve it needs to have a work email that easily identify to the organization name that you are affiliating yourself afterwards to whom you grant other super user industry accesses it's up to you you are the first one we EMA only approve the first one all the others will be managed by this first super user so any industries that indeed we understand we this happened a lot that are contracting work and they would like to have indeed super users that will actually work to other companies it's all fine they are the responsibles by managing who has uh, who is affiliated in sport to their organization the first super user always need to have this email i understand also that there are <laughs> of course some exceptions but to those exceptions indeed as the name indicates there are exceptions we do we spend some time investigating because for example we had cases where because the company was small and they didn't have a work email address but for us to be able to indeed to uh to validate and to understand that what the user is telling us is actually what is happening in the real world, we need to spend uh, some time doing some search and understanding that indeed this is this is the reality. And for those cases, we we will be able to approve as an exceptional uh, request. We'll be able to approve uh, those requests. But this is the rule, and this is the rule that we always enforce. I hope this. It was a bit lengthy, but it was just to to give you the overview, understanding, and how important is this, uh, so that we don't mess up the data uh, later on in the time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can I just yeah, yes, I wanted to give the floor. Is can, can I just add something here? So I've seen a lot of questions on the super user, and uh, to add <laughs> already to the lengthy dis uh, description that Deborah provided, maybe just to summarize a few things. So we do have a lot of documentation in the SPORE portal about the user registration process and the rules available. Uh, we didn't cover it specifically in today, but I encourage you to go to the SPORE portal and look up that information. But one thing I would like to point out is that the super user is designed to manage the users on behalf of a given organization. We indeed encourage you to have minimum two, not just one in case that one resigns or is sick so that you always have a backup and you can have as many as you want. The super user manages the users for the organization, but very importantly, a question I saw recurring in the chat is that any of those users can change any of the data in the system. So just because you're affiliated to company A does not mean that you can only change the data of company A. You can change it on behalf of company A, but you can change or apply for a change request on any data in the system. There is no restriction. So the two things are not mutually exclusive. I saw a bunch of comments in the chat about it, uh, that I need to transfer the access to change the data. No, anybody can request to change any data in OMS not just the one that you're affiliated to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. And Deborah. Um, I see also that uh, Amy uh, raised her hand. So if you would like to ask a follow-up question, you can have the floor. Hello. Uh, yes, we can hear you. 
Yes, uh, hello, hello everyone. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much for uh, like planning out such a great event. Uh, hello, Deborah. So actually, I had one query. Like now, like my organization is a MIA and a testing and batch lease site located in Malta. So one of our client wanted us to be registered in OMS database. So and actually, we were not able to register ourselves. So our client had helped us to register through their login details. And now, as per the new, the changes have came. So, is it possible through the change request uh, we can get the access of the change request? So we understand that, of course, <laughs> and for that reason, we have a very specific role. One second, let me get there. Which is this one? Because we understand that we may not have all the organizations uh, needed for you to actually go into this step where you indeed request the super user role. But mm -hmm. just to highlight that every time, and I'm sure you already have this, every time you create an account with EMA account management, you will be assigned this intermediate access, which is the unaffiliated access. What is the goal of this? The aim of this is indeed not to happen, the situation that you're having now, which is you need to have your organization there because otherwise you cannot request your super user role. And this role is automatically assigned to you once you create it so that you can create one change request in the SPOR portal exactly to be to be able to have uh, your organization available in the dictionary and later on requesting the the this so-called super user role so if you have already this EMA account management uh, account created uh, an account within the EMA account management website if you have this you will have already the unaffiliated role and you can submit one change request at a time. This is very important. Mm -hmm. So when you submit your change request, make sure that the form is correctly populated, it, it, that it has there the necessary supporting documentation, and it shouldn't take more than five working days for us to be able to approve it. And once there, you can finally request your SPOR super user role. Oh. Okay. I think okay. this was your question, right? The answer is... Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. actually, there was another question. Like, okay. sorry, I'm taking your time, mm -hmm. but uh, okay. like, yeah. So actually, while uh, doing prior registration on OMS, like they had uh, like uploaded the old MIA of our organization, and it is not like uh, in in line with the current version with the UDRA GMP. So like through the change request, is it possible to update the MIA as well? The question will be, uh, why is it different? Is it because of data standardization or is it because the data indeed change? So if it's indeed a slightly different and the meaning is the same, then the change request should not be uh, submitted. If it's indeed because the organization name change or because the physical location uh, actually change, then of course, please go ahead and submit uh, the change request so that we make sure that we have indeed the latest version of the data. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel, for the information. Um, I see that Natasha uh, has also her hand up. However, we only have 15 minutes left and still two modules for Deborah to present. So I would suggest that uh, we go ahead with the two uh, modules that are very important and uh, questions can be asked uh, afterwards uh, if we still have time or meanwhile through the chat. Deborah, can you, the floor is yours Thank to you. continue. Thank you. Thank you. So following uh, the change requests, which where most of the changes actually take place, there is, and because we cannot uh, proceed with the returns, uh, we don't have the option to have the returns here. We have, uh, we our main customer service happens through Service Desk, and this is the we use this platform to be in constant contact to support our users with any access issue. We, in case you detect that indeed there is a data quality issue with our data, and um, 
you'd like to report this to us, you'd like to uh, better ha understand what's happening, and all these can be handled through a service desk. As you know, service desk is a very wide and uh, big uh, department. So there are three main stages uh, for us to handle a change request. So the requester uh, submits the change request through uh, the portal. Of course, not to worry, uh, as long as you provide the most details, and I always advise special to OMS users to provide the most screenshots you can, because this will help us understand, better understanding what is the issue and uh, try to further explain uh, how can you overcome this. Once you submit the the call with the service desk, uh, there will be a team that is dedicated to do the first triage. This will, will happen, and they will be mainly categorized by IT issues or business or data uh, issues. So any IT issues will be sent to the uh, support IT uh, team. They will handle, they will fix it, and the issue is concluded. Uh, when we talk any business or data issue, here it will be assigned to our, again, to our OMS uh, data steward uh, users. They will again do a second triage, and this is important because within all the tickets that are assigned to us, we can have a different layer of, uh, and indeed, depending on the issue, we will need to prioritize those those tickets to indeed to tackle them according uh, to the needs. So we can uh, classify them as an IT incident in case there is indeed a bug or a, a issue with the system, then it's actually uh, not allowing the user to, uh, to proceed with any change requests or even accessing the data. We can have some residual uh, tickets where we manage on this on this end. We can have some data quality incidents. These are the ones <laughs> that it brings more attention to us because these are the ones major that we don't want to receive them, but we still receive a handful of them. Uh, not much. Hope I'm glad I'm glad to communicate that we don't have that many data quality incidents reported monthly. But we receive them and we try to fix them uh, within uh, the established SLA. Uh, and uh, we also have other type, two, two other types, which are data quality questions or questions in general, in case uh, the user needs uh, some support in terms of the process, it doesn't know how to access the system, it needs some support or some guidance through what is the correct role that they should they should choose how to actually handle uh, the system. Those uh, will be assigned to our team. The ones that we can, uh, if after this we identify that there is indeed an IT, we can also uh, send it back to our IT team. Otherwise, we will conclude them uh, within the established service level agreement. If it's, of course, an incident, this will be our priority. If it's a more of an acknowledgement or awareness uh, answer, we will have uh, a bit more time to get back to the user and we answer within uh, one to two months' uh, time. And this one is a short one. I don't know if there, there, is, there was already some questions. Uh, on this, or probably I can uh, proceed already to the following. Thank you, Deborah. No questions specifically on this for the time being. You can proceed. Thank you. Okay, I will proceed then. So, last but not least, uh, because we've been talking uh, since we started, we've been talking, I've been bo bothering you with our OMS data quality standards. This is our Bible, this is how we guide us. And we do not, we understand, we do not discard with so many uh, tasks we handle, we do not discard the possibility that there may be indeed some data that is actually published outside uh, our standards. Again, I'm happy to communicate <laughs> that we are within the thresholds, <laughs> not to, to get panic, but just to give you some reassurance that we have uh, 
a very robust and established process on how to tackle this in case indeed something is wrongly approved or uh, an organization is not mastered correctly. We have uh, two main ways to tackle this reactively, and we do this throughout the the tickets that we may receive uh, via service desk if we in, or even via email if we receive any information that is not uh, that was wrongly published, and we take note of this um, of this uh, incident. Uh, other way to tackle uh, to identify those uh, issues is, as as I was telling you, we do change requests. We are currently working on the data cleansing of the of the other GMDP data. So there is a huge volume of work there. And what we do in order to work on a more preventive way, we have a mechanism to and where we do quality control and quality assurance. And we do a sample of the data and we make sure that uh, there is no process bridge there, that we didn't create any duplicates and that, that we didn't create any duplicates and that we are following indeed our rules. It's, of course, this also help us uh, identifying any gaps on the process. It help us uh, with the root cause investigation of those issue, try to identify and who knows, uh, probably uh, improve our OMS data quality standards in case indeed we understand that we're receiving so many complaints. Let's investigate a bit more and let's dedicate some time. And this is one of the cases I can share with you, it's indeed the Swedish addresses, because I told you, OMS is already, um, it went live in 2017. How is it possible that today you are still working on your rules? Because it's a learning process. And the knowledge we had on organization data yesterday is not the same that we have today. And we understand, and we need to accommodate all this. And for this reason, one of these examples, because uh, we received, we were contacted several times by several organizations about the need indeed to in create a second exclusion, uh, a, a second exception, in this case, to create a different set of rules on how to manage the Swedish uh, addresses. Other proactive way we have to monitor our data quality uh, standards is uh, by using uh, a tool that we have uh, that help us with data profiling. We, we've we built some, uh, some profiles having in consideration our business rules. And this, this is something that happens daily. We, um, any data that is created, we have some rules on top of it or, you know, that identify all our, that reads all our dictionary and make sure that indeed we are following our business rules. And once they are identified, they are corrected uh, accordingly. And as I was, I was saying, we did, we have some thresholds established that uh, we'd never want. We find that that is unacceptable to go afterwards. And I can tell that we were, I can happily tell you that we were never um, over these thresholds because indeed we would like to maintain our data quality uh, data and would like uh, to bring other systems on board. And the best way to do is indeed to, to show the quality of the data that we have. And uh, with having you here to share uh, with all the users, um, to have some transparency in all the process that we have, how we do it and how we tackle uh, any any issues we may face. And, uh, and before we go into the questions, I'll just leave you here uh, some links, some supporting documentation. So again, uh, going back to our OMS uh, portal, there you have very complete guidance, very extensive guidance with a lot of screenshots, very useful. <laughs> we also have a few... Debra, excuse yeah. me, could I ask you, a beginner user, where should they start from? OMS portal, always. OMS portal, uh, 
to the exactly from this one <laughs> documentation section you can read more on what is OMS we have documents there what is OMS how you register how we use you can use the system, how to submit a change request, our SLAs, our dictionary. You have, of course, uh, other formats of the same information that can complement. They're not one or another, they complement each other, which is indeed in the video format. Um, and as I mentioned, Last case, last scenario, always in case you've used all these resources and you still did not find the answer you're looking for, always contact us through a service desk. And I'll leave you here as well, two main documents that also, again, available in our SPORT portal. As you can see, we have a lot of documentation there already. If you spend some time going through all our documentation, you'll be able that by now we already have some very extensive manuals, guidances to help you better understanding what we do and how we manage the data. And one of them being this one that we recently published and we created in, with the help of our uh, key user group. Uh, indeed, because it was not clear, uh, it came to our attention, it was not clear, the rules, because indeed we have the rules written, but how do you apply this in a in, in the practical sense? How do you do this? And the key user group helped, helped us putting this uh, document together with a few practical examples for organization and location data. So those... Uh, enrichments that OMS data may, may do into the data. It doesn't mean as long always that the meaning does not change. Any enrichment, of course, as long it's not wrong. If it's wrong, of course, please submit a change request to tell us about it. But if there is an enrichment and this information is correct, uh, we will not be able to um, to ignore the information provided by the National Postal Service. So I'll, I'll leave you here a few examples. You have uh, other way more under the document and another one that this, I think it will be very useful, especially for uh, manufacturers, <laughs> which is indeed the multiple door uh, addresses. We also publish a guidance where we, we've published a set of rules on what to do. So for example, I brought here the case of the Netherlands where we look at the rules, we look at the data, how can the data be in the, your, in the user's documentation, in the source system, and how is the data in OMS and what to do in case you have this. So you have here, just for the Netherlands, you have here, we capture, I think we capture all the possibilities <laughs> and you have, if you go through these tables, you'll be able to under to have a better understanding and uh, to help you uh, taking a decision: Am I supposed to create a change request, or am I actually if, uh, inf do I have in front of me the exact same data, and I'm not going to change uh, create a change request because this is exactly the same data. It's just a matter of data being standardized as per our, our OMS rules. And with this one, uh, I finished the OMS presentation. Uh, again, any further questions, you can address, send them throughout the VET channel, just like uh, Irene and Maria mentioned before. But if in case you have any ver a very specific question for OMS, please contact us through service desk and we'll uh, address it within the correct uh, due time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. Uh, before uh, giving the floor to Isabel for a few closing remarks, uh, there is one question that I believe uh, can be of interest for all participants. How long would it take for a new user to self-train uh, on OMS in terms of time, you know, 30 minutes, hours, just for colleagues to have an idea? Uh, the initial 
it can take indeed it can take probably half an hour or an hour because indeed our guidance until you do the match between all the screenshots we have and the spore portal itself it can take a few minutes I'm not, it's not going to be instant <laughs> but i can tell you that our portal is very intuitive and once you start using it you even without i, I do not i do not like to say this even without the <laughs> the supporting documentation you'll be able to navigate through it because it's very intuitive as long as you uh, you need to understand that Basically, there are two types of access. You have the guest access, which is the access that you have access to the full OMS dictionary, but you cannot submit changes. So for you to be able to have those options to submit a change request, you need to be logged in. And once you have these two concepts in your head, after that, it's pretty straightforward. You'll see that is very intuitive, the system. What is indeed they can take some time is indeed the setup uh, and the affiliate yourself to a company. But this is a one-off. Once this is established, it's then, from then on, it's, uh, it's pretty smoothly. Thank you, Deborah. Very useful for colleagues to know. Um, we are a few running a few minutes late, uh, but I still would like to give the floor to Isabel for a few closing remarks uh, and uh, um, comments on uh, the very informative presentations by Maria and Deborah. Isabel, please. Thank you, Marie. Uh, maybe just a, a few conclusions or summaries of points that I saw throughout the chat. So um, OMS went live in 2017 and indeed is used in many systems already. And in the chat, you mentioned EAF a couple of times. You even mentioned IRIS. So there are systems indeed which are consuming from OMS. But today, the focus was on the new integration of OMS and UDRA GMDP. So for that reason, organizations or people who need organizations that are used as either manufacturers, importers, wholesale distributors are now impacted by this change. So we have in OMS clinical trial sponsors, orphan designation sponsors, many other organizations, but today the webinar is really focused of organizations who are themselves manufacturers, importers, wholesale distributors, or are in need in data of those organizations for their regulatory processes. So that's one important point. Not all the organizations, but critically these different roles. Uh, at the moment, if these organizations are already registered in UDRA GMDP, we are undertaking what we call a cleansing process, mapping and making sure that we register them in OMS. So if indeed you already have a manufacturing authorization, if you have a wholesale distribution authorization, if you've been inspected, you should not need to register or re-register in OMS after January. The details of the organization and address will be there uh, as a result of this cleansing exercise. So after January, uh, what we kind of request is because we're looking at masses and masses of volumes of information, please bear with us. If you find something for which the details are not complete or not exactly accurate, that you inform us so that we can correct it. But there should be very little new organizations missing because we're importing all of the data that is available in UDRA GMDP. In the meantime, that same data is used in EAF. So of course, if today you need to register or submit an application form with the manufacturer and we still haven't got around to it, of course, you can submit a change request. What we ask is if you don't have an urgent application, an urgent submission, kindly wait for us to complete the cleansing because it minimizes uh, the number of requests and activities that we need to do. So. In essence, manufacturers, wholesale distributors, importers, if you need it for an EAF, by all means do request. If you don't absolutely need it, kindly wait for the January deadline. Uh, other important concepts, many of which is uh, what is an organization and a location, and I've seen that we've clarified that specifically in the questions and answers, uh, so I won't go into that. Um, and a, a very 
a recurrent comment that I also saw uh, is still the concern that if anybody can change the data or request the data to be changed, that we will create conflicting information. It doesn't matter if we receive 10 records from Udridge MDP or even 20 change requests. Regardless of how many, we will always check what is being requested against the same trade registry, against the same postal services. And as a result, we only update the data if it reflects what we find in the trade registry and the postal services. It doesn't matter if we receive 20. Ideally, we want to receive less. Uh, so that's why we're doing these campaigns. But it, we won't be changing the data backwards and forwards because we receive 20 different requests from different people. We only change the data if we find something we can re verify in the reference sources. So you should be uh, at ease with that. And I think those are, were the main points that I would like to highlight. Uh, I think it's a big uh, step forward uh, for Europe for aligning data that we use in regulatory submissions, uh, that we use in inspections, that we use in manufacturing authorizations. And of course, we foresee that there will be um, uh, questions and uh, we leave with you the contact of our service desk. If you have any questions on how to submit change requests, on how to register yourselves that you haven't been able to find in the documentation in the SPOR portal, uh, please contact us via the service desk. I wish you best of luck in this endeavor and uh, look forward to meeting you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel, for this summary. And uh, thank you very much also to our presenters, Deborah and Maria, for their very informative presentations. I would like also to thank you, uh, part all participants. We were over 600 today. Um, thank you for staying with us and for your very active participation. You know how to contact us for all support. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and to best support you in these changes. We wish you a very nice day um, and goodbye from UMA team.